From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiker, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. When you look at their respective accomplishments in the arenas of cinema and music, you'd have to look and listen mighty hard to find two more legendary craftsmen who have contributed more testosterone to entertainment, like Clint Eastwood and Mark Mancina. One is renowned as a man of stoic and savage action. The other has often put rhythmic pedal to the metal for any number of adrenaline-fueled scores. Yet both are equally talented at being introspective in their approaches, making it destiny that Eastwood and Mancina would end up behind the collaborative wheel for the very first time with Cry Macho. Here, Eastwood peels away his stoic persona with his talent at conveying regret as a washed-up rodeo rider tasked with retrieving a kid from across the border. It's a journey of a guy who wished he could turn back the clock, imparting lessons on a hot-headed youth whose most prized possession is a fighting rooster. Given no easy task of scoring an actor who's also a composer known for his effectively spare approach, Mancina more than rises to the challenge of Cry Macho with an evocative, tender score that atmospherically sums up the Old West by Mexican way. Drawing on his past as a classical guitarist, Mancina's tense and lyrical chords evoke Eastwood's iconic stature in his most famous genre. It's music that conveys a character's dark past and a use uncertain future on the incident-filled byways of the Southwest, creating a soundtrack that's both cultural and mythic. It's also very much in tone with Eastwood's own beautifully elegic work and this career high point for both men, both looking back to the stuff that helped make their personas while creating work as vibrantly fresh as ever for a voyage that shows just how they got there. And now here to talk about taking a memorable musical road trip with Clint Eastwood and a rooster called Macho is Mark Mancina. Welcome to Feel Music Live, Mark. Hey, Daniel. How are you, man? Well, it's great to have you here. Um, congratulations. It's a wonderful, wonderful film. And uh, music is out now on Water Tower. And uh, thanks to Joe Kara, we've got five soundtracks to give away. So send in your questions. But send let me get you. started. Um, what has Clint Eastwood meant to you? Uh, just what have his films meant to you before we even got on the, on Cry Macho? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've always been a fan. Um, uh, I, I was a fan of um, Charles Bronson. I, I always loved the uh, the movie where at the beginning they, they killed your family and, and you spend the rest of the movie, <laughs> you're going to get back at these guys. And, and you know, Clint's kind of has been that kind of character as well. You know, a, a ju carries justice in his in his holster. And, uh, I love that kind of stuff, but, um, uh, I really, I really loved Unforgiven. I thought that that movie was, um, I, I didn't necessarily think of that as a Clint. I mean, he's in it of course, but the directing of that movie is incredible. And, uh, I, I just thought that movie was really outstanding. Um, and I thought Gran Torino was outstanding too. So, um, I've become more and more of a fan, I think, as I've, as the years gone by. What, what do you think the, the the music? I mean, he's had so many amazing composers, Lyle Schifrin, Ennio Morricone, yeah. Dominic Frontier. I mean, what what do you think about the music for his films before Clint actually started essentially composing with other composers for him? Well, he you know, he's done it longer than we all think he has. Um, um, he told me that he's pretty much been involved in the music since uh, Play Misty. Um, he sits at the piano and he kind of, you know, doodles around and comes up with a tune or comes up with an idea and generally has somebody like a Lenny Niehaus or someone very talented come in and kind of put it together as Clint's kind of hearing it in his head or hearing it on the piano. Uh, and I think he's done, I think he's done almost all of his scores that way. Um, um, and, you know, that's, that's why we've never worked together because he's, you know, when he's made a movie, um, I might, see it you know or he might ask me something about it or something but um you know i've never really worked on 
on anything. I, I, I produced a song for the end credits on, on one of his films, but I didn't, I didn't work with Clint. Um, it was only on Cry Macho that we actually worked together on something. And your studio is in Carmel, where I, I don't know if Clint is still uh, mayor there, but would you guys like bump into each other at the supermarket or something? <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And, and um, we've, you know, we've known each other for some years now. Um, but I think that what happened more than anything was because of COVID, um, he wasn't traveling as much uh, because he was, he's always gone all the time. So, you know, you just don't, you, you'll see him and then you don't see him for a long time. But because of COVID, we were all sort of, um, you know, we were all sort of stuck in the same town. And um, we played a lot of golf mostly and, and had dinner and just, he's, Clint's a very, very funny pe person. I don't know if people know that he's, as funny as he is, but he's very funny and he loves to laugh. He loves to just have a good time. Uh, and so that's kind of what we've been doing. And I didn't, I didn't really expect to work on anything that he was working on. Um, it just sort of happened that uh, he wanted me to see the, a rough cut of the film, but he's done that with me before. He's asked me to come in and, and look at something he's working on when he's editing, just to, just to either give an opinion or or just whatever, support, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but he's never asked me to work on anything. So this one, um, it, the only piece of music that was in, there was no music in the movie. He doesn't temp his mov movies usually. And, and so there's no music when you hit, when you watch the movie, which is refreshing. Uh, and it needed a song at the beginning. And I could tell he, Clint can kind of read people's minds. He's very intuitive. And he was looking at me and he goes, you want to, you want to write the song, don't you? And I said, well, I'd like to give it a go. You know, it's a country and Western song. I've never really written a country and Western style before, but I'd love to, um, I'd love to try because I am a songwriter and I've done written songs for a very long time. Um, so he gave me a crack at it. And um, I wrote something I think that, that really, really spoke for the movie and really found itself um, as a voice for his, his character and also the other character, the, the boy, uh, Raffo, in the movie. So I, I, I had that advantage of being able to write the lyrics knowing that I wanted to kind of nail both those characters with what I was saying in the lyric. Um, and that kind of leads us to uh, Esteban Cortez's question, our first. Um, how was the musical feedback uh, between you two just during the process? So it was really, okay, so you have to understand that, and, and I had to keep reminding myself this, um, there's only one Clint Eastwood uh, in the world. Um, he runs the show. Um, if they screen the movie for the studio, it doesn't really make any difference to Clint, one way or the other, what, what they say or what they have to say. It's, it's very, you know, now they might say, they might give him a few suggestions, he might think about them. Um, but I'm used to people getting very nervous when there's a screening and, and everybody getting real uptight and all of that kind of stuff. And I don't even think Clint went to it. Um, he's, uh, he's very yes, yes, no. You know, if I play him something, he would, he might say, I think that's too big for this movie, or I think that doesn't really have a place in this movie. Or he'd say, yeah, I really like that. I, I really like that. Play that again. Um, that, and so collaborating with him was was a lot of fun. Uh, the the thing about Clint is, you know, if you go back to when when, you, when we were all little kids, of course I can't really say that like everybody, but <laughs> people my age, right? Um, you used to go over to your friend's house, you know, when you were little. You go you just go over to your friend's house to go play. Go, you know, go you know, you just go over there. You don't call him. You don't get on your cell phone and call him when you're seven years old, right? You you just go over to your friend's house and you go over to their house. And sometimes you just go in the backyard because you know he might be in the backyard. Or, um, that's how Clint is. Um, so there have been times where I'm at my house and my wife says, "I think Clint is in our backyard." <laughs> he also. Uh, will just show up, walk through this door right here. That's This is inside my studio, but he, he just comes in and you never know when. So he'll just walk in and the next thing you know, he's kind of standing over you, checking out what you're doing. And So you kind of can't time things. You just, Clint's here. Hey, let's play him what we're working on. Let's show him, you know, a couple scenes or what, whatever. Or he wants to play the piano for a while and do some recording or Kind of, kind of have to be loosey goosey and kind of let it go wherever it's going to kind of go. So you don't have the situation where he sits down and he says, "Go ahead, make my day." <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. We had a, a the uh, 
the pedal steel guitarist that I used on this movie is a, a, a guy named Greg Lease, just a fantastic and legendary steel uh, guitar player. Guitar player. Um, so he came in to record and he sat in the middle of the control room right directly behind me and he was playing and then Clint came in, of course, unannounced and sat right in the couch right here, <laughs> right directly behind Greg. And I could tell Greg was looking at me like, does he like it or is he going to shoot me in the back? You know, but uh, Clint really loved the, the pedal steel. So it was it was really fun. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to just stay and record all day. So. Well, I mean, and you know, and it's an interesting film. You know, I mean, I think probably the best compliment that I can give your music is that it really kind of threw me back to the glory days of Ry Cooter when Ry Cooter was doing film scores. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's definitely an influence for me, and um, I'm a guitarist, and so, um, and my my assistant engineer who runs the studio is also a really good guitarist and from Texas, so. Um, he he was really helpful and he did a lot of playing and I did a lot of playing and we had a a, a guy down in LA who played beautifully and um, uh, it was it was fun to do that because it's a very minimal score it's it's not thick you know it's um, it's minimal but you know th those scores have their challenges too there's not much to hide under you know you whatever you put out there is is there. Um, so uh, it was just refreshing to do that kind of an approach and and really kind of self spot the movie i mean nobody really spotted the movie for me M marlon and i kind of decided where to put music and then if anybody had another suggestion somewhere that they wanted some music we'd put some in but uh, there's a lot more music in the movie than than people kind of think because it is minimal stuff yeah i mean shout out to marlon the speedo um yes, now here's a and here's a question from Dale. Um, can you detail some of the acoustic guitars you used in the yeah. score? Uh, one of them almost sounds metallic, like yeah. a resonated guitar played fingerstyle rhythmically only on the lower strings. Oh, well, that's uh, that's right. That is right. That's a, an old dobro, um, and it is a resonator. Um, the main guitar on that score, I have a, a 1950 J45, and um, I tried I tried several guitars because I have some nice guitars because I'm a guitar clown. And um, the Martins were um, too, just too refined, uh, too, too beautiful. Uh, and the, the Gibsons had this dusty, you know, dusty sound. Um, I didn't change any strings on any of them because I didn't want that sheeny kind of thing. I wanted it to be really kind of down and dirty. Uh, so generally that's what we used um we used a few other guitars of course but the j45 was really the big one yeah you know and, and again it's it's really a, a kind of a really lovely slow burn movie again in a way you know it's almost like the inverse of unforgiven which is just about the worst that humanity has to offer but this movie ends up really being about the best you know and just this really kind of what i call like almost like a get off my lawn road trip buddy buddy right. movie that ends up with like clint petting a pot belly pig and it's, right, it's actually right. quite touching I thought so. I mean, you know, it's not what I think a, a lot of people that love Clint Eastwood kind of want to see him kick everybody's ass. But, um, you know, he's not that guy now. And, and he's he's he, he does love animals in real life. And um, I think this was something he felt close to. I think he this script has been around for a long time, but I think he felt really close to that character. Um, although uh, one, one funny thing is he told me that, you know, he hunched over a lot in the movie because he was supposed to have broken his back as a as a rodeo guy in one of the earlier scenes. And he, he felt like he overdid it and thought people might think that he's really hunched over. <laughs> and I said, well, Clint, you are 91. It's okay. You know, I mean, you know, I'm hunched over. <laughs> what was it? I mean, you know, dude, I'd like to see 91 year olds who look as good as Clint does in this movie, let alone direct a movie. And Make I think actually, and and during, I is during there anyone COVID. else who did it? I mean, during, 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 during COVID, which was really complicated, it's still complicated for me to record, but to, to make a movie, it's so complicated uh, with COVID and he did it, um, you know, um, hats off to him, can I say. How, how did you see the, the kind of developing relationship between, uh, you know, the two characters in Cry Macho and how did you kind of want to kind of get across the idea that they were kind of getting into each other's space, but in a nice way that the kind of crustiness was coming Well, that, that's where that's where the song, I mean, I started the movie with the song 
and and it's never too late to find a new home. To me, that phrase fit both characters because they're both on a journey, uh, and they're both trying to find where they belong. And he at ninety, and and this kid who's I think twelve or thirteen, um, you know, are both lost for the most part for different reasons. Um, but they've lost their family, and uh, they're trying to figure out where they fit in. Um, so I thought I felt like there was a real similar thread throughout the movie between him and the boy, uh, and I thought that the song kind of nailed that, and 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 so did Clint, and it was great because uh, when we found the right singer, I didn't want to play Clint my demo because I, I sounded like a John Anderson from Yes singing um, country. <laughs> Whom you so it, was, it was not, yeah, <laughs> but it wasn't the right sound, and and uh, I knew that. So I, I, Marlon helped find singers and and kind of paraded uh, people on the first verse, uh, and we found some really great guys. But this one guy came in, Will Bannister, um, young guy, and just had this voice that was huge. And when Clint heard that vocal, Clint just looked at me and went, this guy's voice is from the top of your speakers to the floor. It was just like this great sounding voice. And it really fit the character. It fit the song. And uh, so Clint was really happy with that. And I think there's also an, uh, a, a piece at the end of the album that is Clint Clint's score, or like a little bit of uh, Clint's score for the Clint played a couple of pieces. You know, he likes to he loves to play the piano. He likes jazz. Um, and I, I was kind of the jazz police on this movie because I, I just I really wanted to avoid that uh, as best as I could although it's his movie and nobody tells him what to do but I was just I was I just didn't want to have it be a jazzy score I just felt that that wouldn't be right but there's a couple of scenes where he um, just felt like he wanted to have a go at it you know on the piano here in the studio and and so we just recorded several takes and he picked the one he liked and uh, and that that was that cue well, I'd love to. I'm going to get to some more uh, 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 watcher uh, questions for you. And again, we're going to trip a bit through your uh, career as we return to Cry Macho. And, uh, you know, and it's interesting because this is kind of like a, a down Mexico score. But again, in a way, it, it touches upon your uh, real talent for Americana scores. And you can see like the first major one was for Twister, which leads to our, que our question from uh, Glenn R. Brown, who still listens to Twister to this very day. <laughs> I love this score. Shame the melodies are gone in today's music and movies. Well, I have to agree with him. Um, and I will tell you that uh, during the, the, I would say probably, you know, 10 years ago or so, there was this trend. And every meeting I would go to with a, with a potential director or a potential project, the directors would be like, you know, just as long as it doesn't sound like a John Williams score, I'm okay with that. You know, as long as it doesn't have a theme that's recognizable because then it stamps the movie and then that theme is forever that movie and blah, blah, blah. And I would look at these guys like, are you out of your mind? I mean, you want a stamp on your movie. If, if I mean, I'm a composer. Why would I want to write mindless wallpaper music that has no body? You know, there's a place for it once in a while, but not when it's the trend. And it has been the trend for quite some time. And um, it's a shame. So, I mean, all I can say is I just don't write that way. And I'm not interested in, in that kind of score. There's a million guys out there that can hook up their their laptop and create sound. Um, so it's just not really what my craft is. I feel like the hardest thing in the world to do is to come up with five notes that are memorable or three, you know? and. Uh, uh, it's it's really difficult, but but it, it gives it some kind of a signature. I'm still very proud of the Twister theme. In fact, um, last year we had a festival here in Carmel, and the orchestra played the the uh, the opening wheat fields from uh, Twister, and it was really exciting. It was really fun. I actually added some classical guitar to it, and it was did it as a performance, and it was it was really a cool deal. So, um, what was it about the guitar that that made this really one of your first instruments that would lead into your composing career. Yeah, well, the guitar is a funny a funny instrument. You know, because we all grew up with rock and roll and, and we all have seen guys holding a guitar, it just seems like a guitar is kind of a, you know, an, an average instrument. Anybody can play it and it's, it's you know, it's everywhere. Uh, but the truth is, is the guitar is really complicated. And um, the, the more you get into, let's say, classical music on the guitar, it's very, very complicated. 
uh, for, for many reasons, mechanically, for sure, because your fingers are doing two completely different things. And secondly, because you can play several melodies at once, which, of course, you can't do really on a flute or certain instruments. Um, and you, uh, you have no mechanics. So as a piano has hammers and pedals and all sorts of things to help sustain and help, guitar players don't have any of those things unless they're playing electric. But otherwise, they don't have those those things and it 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 makes it a uh, a very personal uh instrument you hold it you put your arms around it uh what could be more personal than that and uh it's challenging and i and i every time i play the guitar something kind of new comes out of it so it's um it's just a wonderful instrument it's not my main composing instrument uh, the piano still is although on clint's movie the guitar was but but most of the stuff I work out, I have to work out on the piano because I've got to work out all the timings and everything with picture and all that kind of stuff. So I generally write on the piano with that stuff. But guitar for me is a, more, more my instrument. And again, you know, Louis uh, Bertolini, uh, he heard a story that you got your start via, via Trevor Rabin scoring movies, or was it the other way around? <laughs> <laughs> I got my start via Trevor? No, 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 no. You can't give Trevor that credit. No, I started Trevor in scoring films. Um, uh, I started up with Trevor in 80, I think it was 89. He asked me to play keyboards for his touring band uh, on Can't Look Away, which was his first solo, not his first, his solo record that came out after Owner of a Lonely Heart. So he was a pretty big star. And he asked me to tour with him. I ended up, because I was a guitarist, I ended up playing guitar with him and keyboards and vocals. Then I um, wrote with him and wrote for Yes for their album Union uh, and, and co-produced some of the stuff. Uh, then I went away to England and, and produced Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And then when I came back, I had an opportunity to do a movie called um, Con Air. But I was also doing Speed 2 and I really felt obligated for Speed 2 because of Jan de Bont giving me such a big break on Speed 1. So. I told Jerry Bruckheimer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need some help on this Con Air thing. Uh, and I got Trevor involved in it. Um, and uh, by the time he was in the middle of that, of course they moved that movie much later and all these things, schedules changed. I had written with Trevor quite a bit of thematic work, but I had to go do the Lion King musical and start rehearsals for that because we were putting that together. So Trevor ended up finishing Con Air. Uh, and so that's kind of how that, that's the truth of that story. And, you know, when you look at, you know, the, how your own breakthrough, you were really kind of one of the, the first wave of composers to, you know, go from working with Hans to, you know, absolutely, you know, breaking through, you know, you'd worked on True Romance, obviously the Lion King, um, and, you know, to Speed, which just got put out in 4k and that sound mix truly rocks the house, yeah, exactly. uh, by the way, um, I guess I talk about the breakthrough of speed and do you, and which leads to a question from uh, John Annenson. Uh, do you still keep in touch with Hans? Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, when I started with Hans, it was really great because Hans was in a kind of a makeshift studio and uh, he had uh, his room and then he had a control room and I would bring my equipment in my trunk of my car. I would park, I would set up, and then I would work on stuff, and then I would sleep in this flea bag that was next door. Sleep, and it was a—I mean, it was a flea bag. Um, but you know, I was—it was exciting. And and at first, I—I I think I worked on Days of Thunder. I think I think that was one of yeah. the first ones, and and worked on songs. And <clears throat> you know, during that time, it was just Hans and Jay Rifkin, who was his engineer, and me. I mean, there was a few other people. It was there, I think Nick Lenny Smith was there once in a while, but but. It was kind of me and Hans, and I and I really liked that. I really had fun with him, and and um, I would work on stuff and play it for him, and and vice versa. And of course, he was doing much better than I was, but he was. Um, it was fun to do that. It was almost like being in a band. And 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 then he built a building, which I was really excited about. And I moved into that building, and um, I had been working on the songs for the Lion King. I've been putting all those songs together for quite some time, but. When I moved into his building, I got the opportunity to work with Jan de Bont on this movie called Speed. It was a very small movie, um, and it was really great. But when I finished that movie, I sort of realized 
there are more people moving in here. It's not just me and Hans anymore. And um, I loved, I mean, I felt a little bit jealous. It was almost like I really felt that it was really fun when it was the two of us. Now all of a sudden there's two other guys down the hall and there's and now there's two more guys down the hall. And it just didn't feel right. I, I stayed through, I did Twister. And during Twister, I had decided I'm, I'm gonna get my own place. I'm gonna move, which was difficult uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but yeah, and I saw Hans, Hans uh, and I worked a little bit on the Lion King live action movie because my song was in it. And uh, we recorded my song at Sony and Hans was there. So we got to spend the day together. We hadn't seen each other in a while. It was really great. And um, we're on perfectly good ter terms. And I spoke with Trevor about two or three months ago and we had great laughs on the phone. And I haven't talked to Trevor for quite some time too. So it was really great to reconnect with those guys. I mean, obviously, you've scored, you know, so many memorable animated films, you know, particularly Tarzan, which had the, the wonderful Phil Collins songs and another, you know, all the Disney work you've done. But for um, PJ, uh, your music from Brother Bear is my childhood. Thank you. <laughs> That's really nice. Thank you. That movie didn't, you know, do that great. Um, and it was. Uh, it was a little odd because, you see, on, on Tarzan, the idea was. Phil Collins was going to do this, the songs, but I was going to co-produce the songs and I was going to write the score, which is all great. And so I played on Phil's songs and, uh, and he played drums on some of the score. So it was a great thing. But on Brother Bear, they actually signed Phil to do the score. Because when I was doing Tarzan, Phil kept telling me, I want to, I want to do what you're doing. I want to learn to do what you're doing. I want to score things, you know. And uh, so they they signed him to score it, and as I think as they got a little bit into it, you know, Chris Montan, who was the head of music there, probably realized probably a good idea to bring Mark into this thing and let them do it together. So it was kind of a co-score, um, which is fine. I mean, Phil is a, a wonderful guy, and he's a hard worker. So I, I don't take anything away from Phil at all. It's just that this is so. This is something that I do and I do well, and it was kind of hard to hold back and let somebody else score some scenes because I'm just used to controlling it all myself, you know, control freak. So uh, that part of it was a little bit tricky at times, but um, I love, there, there's a couple of really good songs in there that I thought were really good. I, I, I enjoyed, I played bass on, on with Phil, which was playing bass with him playing drums. I mean, it's just nothing better than that, you know, it's crazy. Now, another wonderfully unsung score that you've done, and actually one of your most complex scores, is August Rush. Um, yeah. And Alice thought that the Rhapsody from August Rush changed my life from someone who's out of the industry to become a film composer today. Oh. May I ask how you created that piece with all the different musical colors and sounds? Cool, Alice. Um, interestingly, so uh, they're going to have a concert in the forest here and they called me last week and they said, hey, we're going to do a concert in the forest with the Monterey Symphony and we are doing some Sylvester stuff. And Alan's a friend of mine and we, we were neighbors. And I said, um, cool. And they go, well, it'd be great if you could make it because we're also going to do August uh, Rush Rhapsody. And I said, oh, OK, well, I'm going to go to that. I think it's like October 6th or something. Um, but uh, it's not an easy piece to pull off. But uh, so. I wrote that piece. So I told the director and the producer of the film, I said, the, the, the whole, you can't film the film until I write the piece of music at the end. We have to take that piece of music at the end and then draw everything back from it. Uh, and then we, and you need to have that piece of music to film to for the ending. Um, so I did a really, big demo and i i had uh, dave metzger help me with it who's an orchestrator extraordinaire and um i went through it and built bits and pieces out of guitar stuff that i had done and 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 this and that the tapping was my idea that was me playing the tapping when he's got the guitar on the ground um khaki king did some overdubs uh later um, but that was me. I have to say that because other people have claimed that. Um, and uh, I, I, it was just an idea of 
putting together classical pieces. His mom was a cellist, so she would have played classical work on her cello. Father was a rock musician, so there's got to be some rock guitar in the in the pieces. August hears music and everything. There has to be that going on. He sees, here's a choir. There needs to be a choir. There needs to be a gospel singer. There needs to be a pipe organ. I had a pipe organ on stage. I had gospel singers on stage and they never shot them with, when they were filming it. So you don't see them, which is really a shame. But, um, but I do get more compliments and emails from people that say that that piece of music really, really changed their life. I've, I've had that comment a lot and uh, of all movies that I've done. Um, August Rush was a small movie. The critics didn't like it. Um, but I think people that got it really, really liked it and really got it and, and really felt something for it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that movie. Do you think there'll ever be a CD of the score? Like, you know, stuff come, like La Land put out Twister. The yeah. Well, edition, I, so. I mean, I have one. <laughs> uh, so I should market it myself, maybe. Um, uh, I hope so, because there's some really good stuff. You know, there's some really interesting and really good music on it. Um, they released, they released some stuff, but um, they released the song, some a couple of the songs that were in it. You know, we did a musical theater version of of August Rush in Chicago that I worked on for years, and um, uh, it wasn't successful at all. Um, but the music was really good. I, I developed the music into, into songs. And so pieces of the Rhapsody were sung earlier and it, it, uh, it was good. I still have all the demos in there and they're really quite good. Dave Metzger worked on it with me. Marlon worked on it with me. Um, we just had a very dis big disagreement with the director and the, in the direction of how to present this. It wasn't anything close to what I was hoping it would be. So those things happen. You know, what's interesting, though, is that, you know, before the hearts get warmed up in uh, Cry Macho, there's quite a bit of dark music, even though yeah. thankfully things don't end up with Clint pulling guns and blowing right. up people. He gets one punch in. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess, you know, when you look at actually one of your most popular scores, uh, at least in Template, it's Training Day, where yeah. you kind of hear the echoes of Training Day a little bit in, uh, in the yeah. darker music of Cry Macho. Uh, what was scoring Training Day like? It was awesome, man. I mean, that movie the only thing that was a problem for me was um my wife was pregnant and uh we had our baby um during that movie which is such a celebratory time if you have a baby it's 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 pretty unbelievably amazing but but i'm scoring a scene where uh, in a rape of in and and a shotgun in the bathtub and you know i'm just you know these guys playing cards and I mean, those scenes are like, those scenes are tough, you know? And uh, so I was in this juxtaposed place of, wow, I'm having a baby tomorrow, you know? Um, let me, now let me get back to this rape scene. Um, so it was, it was kind of weird, but uh, that movie, I don't know. It's a strange thing that movie. Um, I really felt like the score was really strong and I really felt like the, this, the movie came off so great and it did win an Oscar. Um, but the the music to that found its way somehow to criminal minds and uh that's how i was asked to write the theme for criminal minds and start to score that that tv series was that they really liked training day and uh, wanted something dark like training day was so if you listen to the the main title of criminal minds you'll you'll hear some similarity uh between a, a piece of um score in training day and criminal minds because i was kind of chasing myself there you know and and another one where we need a score release of that yeah yeah my stuff i don't know it, it doesn't get released sometimes i don't really understand how all that works um but you know but I mean, I guess that leads into Cry Macho. You know, obviously it's not going to be that kind of Clint Eastwood movie, but how dark did you want to make war <laughs> <laughs> at points? You know, uh, like how menacing did you want to make I made it? A, there, were some, there were some places. He took a few things out. I had, I had a couple pieces. First of all, I had a completely different ending um, that I thought was really great. Uh, the, the ending is, is Clint at the very end of the movie, the, the before the credits. Um, but uh, I had a couple pieces that were probably a little too dark. Um, 
uh, I just thought when he was driving, you know, across Mexico by himself, there was just something really haunting about that. And I think what I think what we ended up with was really cool, uh, and it has a it has a cool feel to it. But I think I was darker at the beginning when I first started working on it. Um, and I and I I had written something else. I had written kind of a, a Mexican theme for one scene, a kind of up tempo. I had trumpets and I had this whole kind of mariachi thing going. And uh, it just didn't fly. So I think it might, that might be, I think it's on the soundtrack, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that piece. Um, that was the first thing I wrote was, was after the song. You know, and again, if you look at another super influential uh, temp thing, and oh my God, I just watched a trailer today that literally was tempt with the soundtrack from <laughs> True uh, for True Romance. Uh, it just came out as a super deluxe 4K from Arrow uh, Video, the movie did. And I think you might be on the, I don't know if you're on the Blu ray or not, but what was it like working on True Romance? And just, uh, I mean, who would have thought that Carl Orff would be like the next uh, yeah. thing? Isn't that funny? Um, yeah, Tony Scott was obsessed with Karl Orff, and, and and you know the Marimba piece that Hans wrote is almost like a direct lift. But but uh, it was weird working on on that movie because um, Tony Scott was you know kind of an odd duck man. I mean, um, he wore pink shorts every day. Um, he had a cigar and a baseball hat every day, and um, he just couldn't decide what he liked and and it would it would be kind of frustrating because he'd write something that was really rocking and he just would go no i didn't know that and <laughs> he'd try something else and now nah, we're getting hans in here where's hans you know and <laughs> and then hans would come in and, and put a bunch of crap all over the top of this thing and then he'd leave and then tony would go now nah, that's not right you know and, and i'd just be going wow but uh but i i did you know it was a learning process i worked on um I worked on the scene, I think, where all the feathers are flying and it's going really slowly and at the murder, the big shootout thing. Um, I remember that. Uh, I think, I don't know if I worked with Tony Scott on, on anything else. I'm not sure. I think Harry kind of became his his guy. Um, but I, I found him um, difficult. His brother's completely the opposite. I mean, his brother's like charming and sweet and uh, tony was uh really curmudgeonly what's your what's your advice to composers for uh, dealing with impossible directors <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know uh i i gotta say man i've been doing this a long time and i i'm still i'm still not used to it i i read something i think it was jerry goldsmith it might have been john williams i don't remember one of those great great composers said something about, I think it was Jerry, I said something about the night before orchestra sessions, he's just completely nervous and sleepless. And, uh, you know, you would think someone like that, with that much talent and that much know-how and confidence just would never get to that place. But of course he did, and everybody does. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough job. Um, if you're an emotional person, if you're a sensitive, emotional artist, it's a really hard job, really hard. If you're tough as nails and you can kind of walk away from your music and go, screw it, whatever, you know, if you can do that, you maybe you might be better off, um, but I'm not that guy. So I take it to heart. I take every note to heart. My wife will tell you I've driven her nuts for the last 20 years. Um, I care about it and, and I want the best. And and when it gets thrown out or it gets a ridiculous comment, I just got a ridiculous comment about something uh, being too um, ethnic sounding, uh, too exotic sounding. And I, I was just my, I was just kind of like, what? I don't even know what that means. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. But, you know, music is such a subjective thing. You have to keep in mind, Alan Silvestri taught me this. Uh, being a film composer is not being a composer. It's being a film composer, which is a service job. You're working for somebody. You're not Mozart. <laughs> you're not writing your symphony. If you want to write your symphony, go ahead and write it, you know. But when you're working on a film, you're collaborating and you're working with people. And they might not know music and they might not be able to explain music. Um, and you got to kind of put up with that. And you, and you can't be a, a snob about it. Uh, like you're in some music school and say, well, you just don't, you just don't understand my music. Well, that that's not going to get you anywhere. You kind of have to figure out what is it you think they're asking for, and how can you how can you find it without wrecking what you've got going? And it's tricky. Yeah. It's yeah. tricky. Well, 
Mozart got paid by people to write stuff, so he, he, probably, he, he probably had some of the same conversations. Uh, probably so. I mean, you know, it, 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 things don't really change that much, you know? Um, now, uh, John Ennison is a super mega fan of Fair Game. He thinks that theme <laughs> is the best thing you ever did. Uh, are you going to go back to scoring action movies? John, we got to talk a little bit, dude. Um, I mean... Okay, so so that movie, I had written music for something else that I put into Fair Game. Because Fair Game is one of those movies, I think it was falling apart. I think it was like in dire trouble. And I think that uh, the producer called me and said, you got to jump in and make this film an action film because it's not working. But I think I was already working on something. So I think the music that I was working on, I took that and put it into Fair Game and sort of made it fit. I don't even remember it, but it was go it was along the lines of the action stuff that I had been doing, like Bad Boys and, and those movies. It was along those kind of lines. I have, had the same setup and system, so it probably kind of sounds like that stuff, I would think. I don't really remember it. I don't have anything from Fair Game. I don't even have anything saved, but um, I appreciate that you like it, that's for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you got the whole Karma Mafia thing going on over there. <laughs> what, was, what was it like uh, scoring this uh, during uh, COVID? I mean, I imagine, obviously, all you guys are having your vaxes, and if Clint wants to walk in the door, that's totally cool. He does whatever uh, he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was that, you know, especially on a score like uh, Cry Macho, where it's not like a hugely complicated, it's, no, it's, it's a very intimate score. Was yeah. it maybe a bit easier to do that? Well, you know what? I've been working in this studio here for 15 years, um, and I'm right in the middle of Carmel by the Sea, and nobody knows I'm here. Very, very few people know that I'm even here. The only people that know I'm here are, are people that have sort of let come over here and check it out. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty. Um, you just wouldn't know that this is a studio if you were driving around Carmel. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work out of here. I did all of Moana here. In fact, uh, Lynn Miranda stood right over here and sang the opening song. Um, and we, you know, I mean, I've done a, a tremendous amount of work up here, so I'm kind of used to it. So, you know, doing Clint's movie here wasn't wasn't like, oh, this is going to be fun. We get to do it in Carmel. I've done everything up here. Um, I think the difference was that, as I say, Clint loved to be here. He loves music. Uh, so he loved to come over and just walk in and sit down and see what was going on and listen to something or make a comment or play the piano or record something, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, when you look at, you know, the scores for Clint's, you know, very, very recent films are very, very uh, subtle. Um, you know, and there's not a lot of embellishment, even like the mule that Arturo Sandoval did. You know, it's a, it's actually more developed than a lot of his recent stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, what's the challenge like? I mean, are you always kind of aware when you're working on Cry Macho, okay, we got to you can't get too big. You can't get too much. Yeah. And, and as I say, now, if you look at Arturo, right, jazz, I mean, it, it, it's always jazz guys. Um, and, and I'm not a jazz guy. So if somebody asked me to work on something, that's going to kind of be kind of jazz, I would say I'm not the, I'm not the right person. I, that's not really kind of what I know and learned and grew up with. It's just not, not my thing. Um, so on Cry Macho, I just wanted to make sure if I was going to do it, it wasn't going to start to go into a, a jazz world. Um, because then it would sound like me trying to play jazz, which is would be a really bad thing. Um, so one, one little interesting tidbit I'll give you. Um, there's a scene uh, with the mother, <clears throat> Raffo's mother, who is the b beautiful uh, woman who's let him go into the, live and be homeless on the streets. Uh, she has a party going on at her house, and when they go inside the house, you'll hear somebody playing the piano, uh, playing what I call bad jazz, um, and that would be me. And um, the funny thing about it is that uh, they kept trying to find source music for that scene, and they kept playing it for Clint, and he kept going, no, no. And I said, you know what the problem is? If you're in Mexico and you're going to, have to throw a party like she's throwing and you hang around the kind of people she hangs around with, okay, they're going to get some schlocky piano guy. They're not going to get somebody who's a really great jazz player. They're going to get some guy that is going to do it for Coke, you know? So, <laughs> so they're going to get this guy who probably knows like three jazz standards and that's all he knows. 
And that's why you can't find the music because you can't, how are you going to do that? And so Clint goes, well, t tell me what you're talking about. I go, well, let me go play. So I went and played and we threw it against the picture and Clint goes, that's perfect. So um, I called it Cocktail Man because I didn't have any, you know, there I'm like, I don't know what to call it. Call it Cocktail Man. So uh, it was so funny because for weeks after that, Warner Brothers kept sending me emails. Now this Cocktail Man, is this a flip side to the single or is this a new composition that you've written or did you write this with Clint? Does Cocktail Man have lyrics? You know, this whole thing. And I was just laughing the whole time going, Cocktail Man, man, it's just, it's just a little piano thing, it's nothing. You know what? Thing again. This is quite one of the really nice things about Cry Macho. It kind of really, you know, when there's so much prejudice against Mexican people, it yeah. really kind of, yeah. you know, shows Mexican people in a nice light. And again, if you, uh, oh my God, why am I blanking on the, this really cool western that he did uh, with John Saxon playing? Um, oh. Uh, the, the revolutionary, and you think the whole thing is going to end up with him, you know, shooting it out with John Saxon, but it ends up with him uh, teaming up with the revolutionaries, right. and right. suddenly it ends up being like a movie, like, "Hey, Mexican people are good people," and and it, you know, and that's a big message uh, um, of uh, Cry Macho. But but yet, when you when you listen to the music, a lot of it sounds like okay, this is like the music of the of the Grizzled Sheriff's Last Ride which leads to what I'm rambling on about. What's the difference between Western music and Mexican music in this well, war? Well, okay, so Mexican, a lot of Mexican music is influenced by German polka music. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, Germany um, came to Mexico and brought that music with them. And if you listen to a lot of mariachi stuff, the beat and the feel is the same as a polka. Uh, so that's one type of Mexican music. but. Clint didn't really want Mexican music. Like when I saw the movie, I said, oh, this is Texas and Mexico. So Tex-Mex is what we're gonna write. We're gonna write kind of Mexican stuff with Tex. But every time I wrote a little bit more in a, in a Mexican traditional style, he didn't care for it so much. And I think, I think for him, it wasn't, it's not a movie about Mexico. It's a movie about people and humans. And, uh, and that's what I liked about it. It's, it's very non-political. You know, it's not political in any way at all. Um, it's really about people's journey. Uh, and, and, you know, he, I mean, I don't want to give it away, but you know, the journey that they make, they both end up in different countries, right? They switch basically. And I just find that to be really charming and, and a, a cool idea. And, and as you say, I mean, you know, we're used to the Mexican movies where the Mexican guys are all bad guys and they're, you know, robbing everybody blind and everything. And this movie's not like that. There's some bad people. There's some great people. They're on both sides. You know, it's just humans again. So uh, I I think it's just a very, very human movie. I, I think that's what its strength is. Yeah, that's why I love it. And the movie I was going on about was Joe Kidd. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know, I mean, when you look at, you know, the original script of Macho, I mean, it definitely is this as a, the, originally the rooster got eaten by an eagle, uh, Clint's character gets thrown in jail, you know, right. I mean, this definitely has a far more optimistic uh, take on the original script that's been going on for decades. How do you think the the music, again, ends up, it ends up in that place? Because, again, you know, you could look at it, boy, I don't know why this kid is going off with this dad, you know, when he maybe should be hanging out but going right back to that town with Clint. So how do you, you know, there's, there's still kind of question marks at the ending, but how, how important was it for the music to kind of give it that sense of closure nonetheless? I think that's the, I think for me, that's just a rough spot for me because I really preferred what I had written for the end and we didn't use it. Ah. It's, it's on the album. Uh, but I think I, what I did was I kind of brought both sides together in the music, I feel. I think Clint wanted something way more simple than that. I mean, really simple and just not really commenting that way. And that was his, I mean, his movie. Uh, so in that regard, I kind of wasn't able to nail that part of it. But but what I did feel proud about was the, the emotional scenes that are in there, the, the relationship between Marta and Mike. Marta's the woman that owns the cafe. That relationship, I feel like, is so great in that in the movie. It's so real to me, and it's um, uh, it doesn't feel like people are acting. It feels just like a natural. 
and I wanted the music. I didn't want the music to get in the way of that and be schmaltzy or, or push it too hard and 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 be you know corny in any way. But I but I knew it needed music there in, in those spots, and I'm kind of proud of it because I think it works really nicely, and I don't think it gets in the way. I think it plays it just just enough. Yeah, and and again, you know, one thing I really like about the movie is just kind of how rambling it is. You know, it's just an unforced character study that just kind of goes its merry, sometimes not so merry way. Right. You know? Right. And you'll notice, um, as I was saying about his sense of humor, I mean, as an example, I can tell you, so we have a little movie night that we do. And, uh, you know, I always ask him, well, what do you want to watch? You know, what, what movie do you want to see? Because I'm thinking he's going to want to watch, uh, you know, Gone with the Wind or something. I don't know what he's going to want to watch. What, what would Clint Eastwood want to watch? Well, we've watched Blazing Saddles. We've watched Best in Show. Uh, we've watched The Producers, you know. Mel Brooks and and funny stuff and Clint loves it you know just loves it, um, loves to laugh. Who who doesn't when it comes to Mel Brooks? That's the teaming I want to see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be interesting. So tell me what what's ahead for you? Uh, what what are you working on now? So I'm working on a really big thing. I say big, I mean musically big because there's got to be seventy two pieces of music in it and. Um, it's Celtic, it's action, it's sound design, it's it's uh, it's all over the place. It's really fun. Uh, it's called the Sea Beast. Um, it is co-written by the director Chris Williams, who I worked with on Moana. He was a co-director on Moana. Uh, he's a great, a great director, a great storyteller, wonderful guy, and uh, and this is my first project with Netflix and. They're trying, you know, they're, they're, I don't want to say they're going up against Disney because that sounds ridiculous, but, you know, this is a big animated movie for Netflix to do. And they haven't really established themselves as a big animation studio. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, not in the Disney tradition, there aren't really songs. There's one song, it's a shanty that's in there, but there's, there's not songs, it's not a musical. But yet the music drives the story. I mean, the, the music is pretty relentless and all over the place. Um, so we're just about to record our first batch of orchestra stuff at Abbey Road in about uh, two and a half weeks. Wow, that's awesome. I'm um, not sure when it's coming out. I mean, things are so, everything's so weird. I, I mean, I don't, I, I would assume it's going to be streaming on Netflix, you know, uh, but I, I really have no idea when. We're not really dubbing the movie until January. So uh, I don't know if they can, they release now right after that, you know, because they could, right? Uh, or if they hold it back for the summer. I, I really don't know. I don't know. You know, I have to jump back into Twisterland, uh, you know, because obviously, you know, we uh, with the, the very sad passing of Edward Van Halen, I personally am a huge fan of the underscore he did for the wildlife. I'd love to see a release of that. Yeah. But what was it like working with, I mean, like a rock god on Twister? It was great. I mean, listen, man, they sent me, so I'm working on Twister and I have this idea, okay? My idea was they're chasing the tornadoes and they're gonna come over the hill and what I wanted to do now, they have since done this idea because they stole it from me, I'm telling you. But but the idea was back then. I told Jan de Bont, here's the idea. So we start with a full orchestra playing Baba O'Reilly. So an orchestra playing the intro to Baba O'Reilly is going to sound like a score piece. It's going to sound like something I might have written. You know, while they're chasing it. But people in the know are going to know, wait, that's the who, I think. When they come over the hill, you cut into the who and Roger Daltrey and the big scream and the power chords. So Jan was like, oh, that's a, that's a great idea. I love that idea. Um, so about two weeks later, the studio calls me and says, they want you to go talk to Eddie Van Halen about your idea. I thought, Eddie Van Halen? He's not in the who. Um, and then I thought, oh, maybe they want to re-record the song which I don't know about that because it's so iconic. It's the who, you know, I don't know if you want to re-record that. So I got to Eddie's house. Now, of course, I'm pretty nervous because I love Van Halen, man. And I'm going over to Eddie's house, right? So I'm, I'm drive over there and uh, there's Valerie, right? His wife and little Wolfie who was a little kid and, uh, and Alex. And uh, where's Eddie? I don't know where Eddie is, you know? 
But once Eddie came into the studio, so Eddie thought, and Eddie was right, I was wrong, that they were just going to write an original song. And then I was going to put my score around it. The, the Who thing was gone. It was like that didn't even exist to anybody. It was uh, Eddie Van Halen's going to write a new song. But I didn't know this. So Eddie's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling Eddie the idea with the Who. He goes, yeah, I love that song. Yeah. Let me play you the song we're going to do for the movie. I went, what? He goes, let me play you the song. So he played the song. But what I didn't know was that Eddie was nearly deaf at that point. This is 96, I think. Uh, when he played the song, it was so loud that the pencils blew off the console. <laughs> All I could hear was like white noise. I couldn't even hear, you know, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. And that's kind of when I realized, oh, they're going to write a song for the movie and they want me to make it fit into the score. That's what we're talking about. So uh, that was a thing called humans being. Um, and so it just, the idea died and it wasn't until, I think it was uh, NCIS or one of those TV shows that Jerry Bruckheimer does that I heard Baba O'Reilly is the opening piece. And I went, yeah, well, somebody wised up. <laughs> so. So I guess to, to wrap our show up, uh, what has it been like to work with just a legend to all of us in our youth and uh, hopefully not even the beginning of his August of his years uh, with Cry Macho? Yeah. Uh, you know what? I think he's going to do another movie. I mean, I just know him and, and he just, he doesn't stop. Um, it's been great. I mean, listen, you know, I had to get over the hump of, this is Clint Eastwood in my room, sitting next to me, talking with me, laughing, making jokes. You know, I, I got, I, I, and I grab my guitar and play something for him and start thinking I'm playing for Clint Eastwood. I'm playing for Clint Eastwood. I had to like get rid of that, you know, and just go, this is just a dude, man. It's just a nice guy. He's a fun guy. He's, he's just a guy. He's a famous guy, but he's just a guy. And um, it took a little while, but eventually, eventually now I feel extremely comfortable around him. I feel like I can, I can say anything. I can make jokes at him. And, you know, I don't feel like, oh, no, he might get mad at me. I, I know him well enough to know, you know, what not to say. But but certainly I can joke with him and have a lot of fun. And uh, to be just a little tiny flick on one of his movies for me is like a dream come true. I mean, I, I'm really, really proud of it. And I'm I'm so grateful that I was able to work with him and that it sort of worked out. Well, Mark, I could say it's a dream come true to have you on Film Music Live. I just want to thank you so much for joining us on the show. I want you all to watch Cry Macho in theaters and on HBO Max with Mark Mancini's score available on Water Tower Music. Yes. And thanks to our show producer, Dale Turner, Mark Northam, Mark Banning, Marlon Espino, and Joseph Cara at Water Tower Music. We'll see you all in the next, the next episode of Film Music Live. Thanks, Mark. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you.